Hello, good morning everyone, or good afternoon, and um, I hope you are enjoying, if you have, a spring break. So this is going to be um, my next proposal, my next session. Welcome to my YouTube video, my name is David. I would like to discuss with you a recent reading that I've just finished, and it's uh, the reading of a book called Grading from the Inside Out. Um, this book is based on um, different perspectives and strategies and ideas regarding student assessment and it makes us think about the way in which you, you we assess or the way in which we give grades, numeric grades or letters as grades for student work. Um, this proposal is about, again, this book from Tom Schimmer, a very interesting one um, and basically um, a couple of questions that I would like to share with you. The first one is how can we measure students' achievement without considering letters or number grades? We are in a system, in an educational system, where we have a tendency to use grades and numbers to show achievement or to show um, the results of a learning process of the students. However, in this book, in Grading from the Inside Out, the author talks about the standards-based grading, which is a process of grading that provides explanation on the concepts or the material that students should know at each point in their education. Those concepts or this material can be called learning standards. And those learning standards, what they do is provide a baseline that is consistent across all students at this educational level. So let's have a look. While reading the, the, the book, I just came up with a, a list of sentences or facts that the book presents and questions that came to my mind while I was reading it. Questions that made me reflect on my own teaching process and my own teaching strategies. Overall, before going through those questions, I would like to see the benefits of this standard-based grading are, from my point of view, five. And these are the five big benefits. The first one is that it provides meaning to the grades. So the grades given to the students in whichever format we want, um, based on the standard-based grading, it gives, it, it, it facilitates the understanding of the grading process and its expectations. But this understanding is not only for the students, it's also for the teachers, for ourselves. But basic, based on, on, the, on the student understanding, these will allow um, for self-assessment strategies or peer assessment strategies where students will be requested to analyze and to better understand the grading process and will, will give them the possibility to give a grade to their peers or to themselves based on rubrics which are there and are specific and meaningful to them. The other benefit is that students and teachers are kept accountable, which means that those objectives those learning standards are known by everybody. And just the first of my questions, what do you think of having the students taking part of the planning, of planning and the setting of the objectives? Can we propose to students when we plan the, the, the unit um, an interaction with them and say, okay, uh, then for this unit, what do you think the objectives, the learning standards should be? Could we base those learning standards on a conceptual understanding, on skills development, on content? So basically, teachers and students are all of a sudden accountable for the process. Um, uh, the standard-based grading is very, very much based on the type of feedback that we provide. And we're not going to spend time in this session talking about feedback because there are other sessions in my channel about it. And I invite you to go and have a look at these other videos on how feedback can be or is crucial in the learning process. The standard-based grading, from my point of view, also supports differentiation of instruction because basically by implementing formative assessments, uh, these formative assessments lead to reflection on practices, on learning process, and when teachers reflect on their practices, automatically they also reflect on differentiation strategies that are implemented, looking at the results of this standard-based grading. And finally, it does increase self-motivation. How many times have you heard the typical questions from, from the students saying, um, sir, ma'am, will this be graded? And it depends. If you say no, that probably the students lose motivation towards the task. So little by little, these questions will be replaced by uh, uh, other questions that will lead to a better understanding of the material, in particular if students are involved, become accountable. So again, 
let's go to the book now and what I'm going to do is I'm going to propose um, several sentences that that struck me when I read in the book and made me reflect and I'm going to share with you some questions that came to my mind and it would be great if you could in the chat of these sessions write some comments or maybe some questions that also came to your mind based on certain aspects so the first one the, the first the first uh, the sentence that 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 I found very interesting is that grades must be a reflection of students' proficiency, not a reward for compliance. What do you think about that? Um, the way in which we use grades in, in school, does it reflect proficiency? Does it reflect achievement of a certain level? When we give feedback to the students, what kind of feedback do we give when we talk about the, 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 the aspects to be improved, the even better if? Do we target top grades? Do we target the next level of achievement for the students? And if we look at the final grades that we give, being numbers, being letters, what does it really represent? Does it represent the holistic development of the student as a human being? Does it reflect his level of knowledge of the precise content? So that was my first question. The second one is that the authors say that each assessment and grading experience as an isolated event is erroneous. And it says that each assessment experience links with the other before and the one after. And that is probably in the way when we plan, um, do we take consideration the student's prior knowledge when we plan the assessment? When we start a unit, do we put in place strategies that help us to better understand the prior knowledge of the student and then we plan accordingly? Does the task that we proposed in the past unit link with the one of this unit? Will it link with the one of next unit? So some of you will say, well, no, because in each unit we teach different content. What about if we present a curriculum as a spiral when we always come back to certain concepts and certain principles? That would help us to understand the importance of the prior knowledge and it will help us to plan accordingly and, and to link units one with the other. Another question that came to my mind when reading the book was about feedback. And, um, and it's quite important for me to, to really understand the importance of feedback and to use the feedback appropriately. And as I say, there is a session on feedback on, on my channel, which I invite you to, um, to look at and share your perspectives. Basically, the authors say that the goal of standard-based grading is to, to be accurate, to accurately report students' proficiency while maintaining the students' confidence in their continuous growth. And this can be done only through appropriate and quality feedback given to the students in their formative tasks, but also in their summative tasks. If we consider the formative task as a training process, as a process that will lead to success in the summative task. The success, the improvement, the development, the understanding, the motivation can only come through appropriate feedback. Feedback that is given on time, that it, it, it highlights the positive aspects, but it also makes reference to all the aspects that should be improved. It must be specific, must be focusing specific targets and that's what we're going to look at in the next assessment. Another question is about the performance-based tasks. And if you don't know what a performance-based task, I invite you again to go back to one of my past sessions, which is about these in particular. But at some point, the author asks if we can assess cross-curricular competencies through performance-based tasks. What does he mean by cross-curricular competencies? competences. Uh, it can be interdisciplinary projects or transdisciplinary projects if you work in the PYP or in the MYP. It can lead to transfer of skills between subject to subject if we teach at any other curriculum. Um, but it makes me reflect on uh, when we try to develop skills through those performance-based tasks and I will use grasps as the main activity, should we assess the skills? Because if we're looking at assessing standards, skills is part of this 
transdisciplinary standards. And then if we want to assess on that, how do we do it? We need to produce rubrics to assess expected level of achievement. Or how can we measure development or improvement in skills based the standard-based grading? That was my main question. Another one is the importance of reassessment. And these can create some conflict when we look at our academic integrity policies or academic honesty policies. To what extent should be given the chance to the students to redo their work so we can reassess it. Uh, basically, reassessment is a way to improve assessment strategies. This is what the author says. What do we think? Is it ethical to allow students to complete, to redo an assessment? I particularly allow my students to redo tasks. And there was a problem at some point on if students know that they can systematically redo a task, how can we make sure that they will do their best in the first attempt? Well, the author proposes some kind of a social contract, and this is something that we do in class as well. We clarify to the students that there are certain levels of expectance. Something is expected, basically, in the first task, and then feedback is given. But the purpose of feedback is to allow students to reflect on it and then to take it as a way of improvement. And the only way for them to show that is by redoing that assessment, that piece of task. So the importance of reassessment is crucial, and I understand, and I agree. Now, I would like to discuss with you to what extent is something that you put in practice, to what extent you consider it something that fits into your academic honesty policy, and to what extent this is ethical. But I think it's very important to discuss about the importance of reassessment. Um, a very interesting sentence that comes from the book, the mean can be mean. So basically is that some educational systems, what they do is when they give a final grade, they, they look for the mean of the grades, isn't it? Sometimes this mean can be counterproductive. And I gave an example of, of the MYB or the IB programs, but that can happen across the subjects. Is the mean a perfect reflection of students' work? Does the mean show improvement? Let's see if a student starts with a very low grade in one unit, but finishes with a very high grade. Well, we take the mean, the grade is halfway through, isn't it? But does that reflect the improvement of the students? Um, I think it doesn't. And I think we should have a more holistic approach, a best fit approach to what the final grade of a student should be based on progression. Best or based on not doing the mean, but looking at the improvement of the student. And I'm going to just give you a very basic example of how the mean can give wrong impressions. In geography, we were talking about the GDP at some point, the gross domestic product. And I was just saying that if in a country, there's just two people living in that country, and one person has one million pounds or one million dollars or one million, one million euros, and the other, sorry, two million, and the other one has nothing. Yeah, if one person has two million and the other one has nothing, the mean, the GDP of that country is one million. But that does not represent the reality because we have half percent of the population that has absolutely nothing. And the other half has two million. So that's why the mean does not always represent the exact, the accurate, the accurate reality of a space. So think of the mean as a way of giving the final grade. Should we consider that? Or should we take into consideration other aspects which show progression or improvement? Finally, this is one of another great proposal that the book, the book says that there's a very interesting approach to homework on that chapter six, to a point that the author proposes to call it home learning instead of homework. What do you think? Um, do you believe in busy work? Do you believe in homework as a way to improve? Does homework have to be systematic? regular? Does it have to be graded or not? So just consider that. Think about that. Um, and, then, and, then, and then we can discuss. I hope you enjoyed the session and that was clear to you. If there's any question or anything you would like to share, please feel free to do that on the chat. Thank you.